So, lecture number six. We're on to our second of a series of these lectures that are talking about electric logs as they apply to the oil industry. Today we're going to be talking about gamma ray logs. And then, uh, this, uh, so this will be the last one that you probably have some familiarity with before we go into things that I'm pretty certain you've never heard of before. Things like neutron and density logs, etc. and uh, how they're applied. Now once again, this is important stuff because it's going to be relevant to our first real lab assignment which will start tomorrow. Um, if anybody's got any scissors at home, <laughs> bring them. I did an inventory of the scissors. I, I actually bought about 12 pairs of scissors for geophysics the last time we taught this and of course people stole them and there's none left now so we're going to need as many pairs of scissors as possible and tape dispensers. Um, yeah, but you're going to have to be cutting it on the countertops. It would be a better idea if you actually didn't do that and also. And remember, if you've got blunt nose scissors, bring them along. I don't see you guys running with them. Uh, anyway, last time we met, we uh, got our first introduction to electric logs. Uh, we talked about um, how the first electric logs were run, which is always nice to have a little bit of history behind it under your belt to understand where we come from. And again, like all things technological, the advances have been absolutely stunning in terms of how fast things have been done. Uh, then we talked about resistivity logs, and then we talked about SP or spontaneous potential logs and those are the two logs you're going to have your first introduction to in terms of the lab assignment tomorrow. A uh, reminder that we uh, owe the first true vertical assessment of uh, electrical properties, in this case resistivity, to the Schlumberger brothers uh, who did this in uh, Europe in 1927 and, and basically they uh, started the Schlumberger company which is still uh, I believe the largest of the major oil supporting uh, companies that are out there uh, included with them of course Addresser Atlas and Halliburton now um, and essentially all this was was just basically doing the same type of thing you had done previously out in the field where you actually measure in resistivity across a field and in this case they actually put it into a vertical capacity and pulled it up from the bottom of the hole upwards and managed to see these changes which they linked to reservoir uh, uh, characterization, in other words different types of rock units and well, fluids that were in the rocks. Uh, we talked about how they do it now. Um, these are some of the SONs, the multiple SONs that have been developed and again every time I look at something like this I still find it absolutely astonishing the technology that's in these small little packages and they, they have to be because you know you're putting these things into a small hole. What we haven't talked about is the diameter of the holes that are out there. Um, the various types of holes that will be drilled depend upon how much money you've got, how deep you're going and the capacity of the drill rigs. I've seen exploration holes that are between four and six inches in diameter which is not very big but I've also seen some huge drill bits that are 36 inches in diameter and while I've not actually seen them running these devices in any of those large holes, I have to assume that they have devices that are designed for the larger capacity as well because you need to have a fairly tight fit. Certainly with the caliper component down through here, it's got to be able to come in contact with the bore walls of things. So these are fascinating things. Uh, the actual logs themselves, we talked about resistivity logs um, in terms of shallow versus deep induction and the reason for this was of course you have to worry about infiltration by both the drilling fluids and the muds. I'll show you a diagram that illustrates that again towards the end of today's recap. Uh, but this gives you an idea of the style of things you're dealing with and of course for the logs that we're going to be doing for the petroleum industry, this would be a strip that will be as long as the hole happens to be deep. Okay, So this particular one probably drops, that looks like 14,800 feet, so you're probably dropping down 100 feet per package and if you're dealing with something that's 14,000 feet long, it might be something that's a 10-foot roll of paper. Yeah? Are the shale and the sand baselines always on those graphs? No. Or you just take it to the end? No, in fact, it's, uh, it's up to the, uh, uh, the exploration geologist to establish what is the shale, shale line, what's the sand line. And remember, you've got to worry about things like drift, too. So simply saying that everything up to that point here is going to be sand, everything up to this point here is going to be shale is a dangerous conclusion to make. So you have to have flexibility in terms of what you're looking at. Okay. Um, we talked about the, um, uh, what controls resistivity. All these variables are important, including the temperature. And this is why you have to be familiar with some of these conversion tables. And I'll, I'll bring in the books and show you these things in lab tomorrow. Um, I suppose if we had more time, if this were a course that were designed exclusively for geophysics as it applied to petroleum, we would be going over some of those exercises. But frankly, we don't have time to do that, OK? We, I really need to get you on, uh, some experience in terms of how to actually do the correlations and the interpretation 
interpretations. And those charts, frankly, are things that if you do get to oil, they're going to be putting you through the ropes of those things anyway. Schlumberger would do a much better job of teaching you that than I would, so I'll leave it to them to do it. Um, SP logs, we talked about them as well, and again, this is where you start seeing things like the sand line versus the shale line identified on that. And um, Chase, you said, do they put that on? It, depending on, on, on how you're going to be getting these data, as I said, in the good old days when I had experience with this, everybody got strip logs. I mean, we had these things up all over our office walls. In fact, our office walls in the oil industry were Car were uh, composed of um, corkboard, so you could pin up things everywhere. Um, nowadays, everything being done with computers, you know, it's going to be coming to you as a computer, and there's probably going to be a lot of stuff that are available where you can just click a button, and it will add a sand line and color code everything for you, based upon what the computer is interpreting things. And you know how computers are great sometimes, not all the time though. And the difference between whether you're going to find something everyone else has missed is how much you rely on having it automatically interpreted for you. So uh, a good geologist don't rely on that. And there's a sand line versus a shale line. Again, again, be aware of signal drift, etc. And incidentally, there's a gamma ray log on the other side here. That's what we're going to be talking about in just a few minutes. And this is important here too because after a while you start to recognize packages or responses on various types of logs. Uh, I gave you this first little blip here that deals with SP logs because these are basically sand bodies and the different, cons uh, different uh, uh, characteristics of the sand bodies will affect how their response to things like an SP log are going to vary. So we talked about the idea of getting these gradual coarsening upwards sequences, coarsening upwards sand bodies that themselves are getting thicker over time is interpreted as being some sort of a progradation of a deltaic body. You can also get things like this. You can also get these finding upward sequences. What's not shown here are things like meandering river deposits. You can recognize meandering river sands if you have a good enough SP log because sand bodies associated with point bars tend to fine upwards and as they fine upwards they have more shale or clay particles involved in them. So it's not unusual to see this characteristic of an SP log that would be interpreted as a point bar deposit where this is the coarsest grain component binding upwards and getting eventually muddier as you go up sequence. So if you see a bunch of these things, then what you probably have interpreted, or what you can interpret it as, is a series of meandering river point bar channels that are all in a depositional sequence. And of course, these are hot things to go for because they are surrounded on either side by floodplain shales, which are tight beds, and these things, because they tend to be bodies that will cut out periodically, mean that you could have a subsurface stream, a point bar, that potentially is full of a fluid, and if the fluid is a good fluid, then you know, you've hit yourself a nice little pay zone, if you know what I mean. And then we, uh, this was the diagram, I actually put this in earlier in the, um, in the lecture we had previously to give you an idea that there are variables you have to be aware of, and that includes the infiltration zone where different things are going to happen. Again, if you're going to be measuring things like electrical responses or resistivity, a lot of variables, you have to understand that the very process of actually drilling the hole is potentially going to change the properties of the rock primarily in direct contact with where the hole is. So depending upon what kind of test you're doing, sometimes you're picking up more of the properties of the flushed or transition zone than you are of the rock behind it. So that allowed us to introduce the idea of shallow versus deep resistivity, okay? And that's basically what is, uh, is dealt with by those different parameters. All right, now here's today's uh, class or uh, lecture um, agenda. It's not going to be particularly intense uh, because we're just going to be going over the basics of one additional log. Uh, that is the gamma ray log. First thing we're going to do is talk a little bit about radioactivity. Uh, as you should be aware, gamma rays are produced from the radioactive breakdown of certain unstable uh, metals. Uh, and those metals are associated with certain types of formations. And we'll go over how they're for, uh, associated with it and also go over some of the potential problem beds because every once in a while you'll get something that doesn't behave the way it's supposed to and you may misinterpret it. So you have to be really careful. You have to know your area that you're studying. Uh, we'll talk about gamma ray emissions and then I'll introduce you to the gamma ray logs. You'll get into these in the second set of uh, logs that we're going to be doing, not in this week's lab assignment, but next week's lab assignment. 
So here's your introduction to gamma ray logs, gamma rays, radioactivity in general. Okay? Radioactivity is common, it's everywhere. In fact, if you were to take a Geiger counter outside, if it was sensitive enough, it would start kicking over all over the place because there's radioactivity just about everywhere. If you've got a watch with luminescent dials, there's a certain amount of radioactivity associated with it as well. We're used to it as part of our psyche. In fact, it's probably an important component in driving evolutionary change. So it's there. But you can take advantage of it if you know what to look for, okay? The most useful isotopes, at least as far as petroleum geology is concerned, are these three. Uranium, thorium and potassium. Okay, now there's a whole bunch of different radioactive isotopes in both uranium and thorium. There's only one radioactive isotope of potassium. That, of course, is potassium-40. Okay, it's a classic example of um, of gamma decay among the um, uh, the different elements we talk about uh, in previous courses here. All right, now there's one of three modes of radioactivity that you need to be aware of. Okay, and again, this should be recap. From, uh, from Geology 112, and I believe Dr. Allison talks a little bit about this too in terms of some of his classes. Alpha decay is the easiest to probably understand because what it deals with is the loss of what is, is essentially a helium particle. Now the idea here is that when you get unstable nuclei, things like uranium, they are so heavy, they have an imbalance of neutrons to protons. What eventually happens is some of those particles are booted out to try to make the um, nucleus more stable. Now in this case, we talk about the helium nucleus. It's essentially a particle consisting of two protons and two neutrons. And of course, this is shot out of the nucleus of the larger atom at an appreciable speed. And this, of course, is one aspect of radioactivity. Alpha decay, alpha radioactivity, is actually not too dangerous. Well, I guess you have to be careful here. I mean, there's radioactivity and there's radioactivity. Uh, when I've had the radiation safety people over here tech checking our radioactive minerals to make sure that we don't have anything really to worry about, they always come in and, and they're kind of cool people. They'll, they'll come in and they'll put their hand over top of them and say, like, I wouldn't worry about that. If they're not worried about it, I'm not. But you can play a game with this by determining the amount of radioactivity just by holding the Geiger counter at a certain height. Alpha particles decay very quickly. So if you get away from the surface, say about that far, you're not picking up any alpha particles at all. Alpha particles can actually be held back. I, I believe someone told me once by a piece of aluminum foil would do it. So they're not particularly bad. They're heavy particles and all, okay? Uh, the other uh, type of decay is beta decay. Uh, in this case, this is a little bit more complex. What happens here is that you basically lose an electron uh, and that's basically what's coming off as the beta particle here. And in so doing, what you end up doing is changing one of the neutrons in the nucleus into a proton. Uh, the classic example of this is C14 going to nitrogen 14. Okay. Um, so essentially, when you say you're losing a beta particle, what you're doing is you're losing uh, an electron. And the last type of decay, gamma decay, is where you basically capture an electron and go just backwards. You take one of the protons and convert it into a, nu into a nucleus. Now, each one of these types of radioactive decay, whether it's alpha, beta, or gamma, is characteristic of the radioactive isotope. It's, a say, it's basically as consistent as the rate of radioactive decay. It's driven by physical laws, physical principles. It doesn't vary whatsoever. Okay? So from the point of view of what we're doing in the oil industry, it hardly matters what kind of radioactive decay is going on. We don't care about that. From an academic interest, it's really kind of cool. But again, the oil companies don't care. What they want to do is they want to say, how can we use radioactive decay, naturally occurring radioactive decay, to help us interpret what the subsurface is all about? Okay. Ultimately, gamma ray emissions can occur in all types of decay, all right? And ultimately, you're getting this little sense of radioactivity that we can measure using a Geiger counter, okay? So we're targeting just gamma rays in general, as it turns out, for reasons that I'll go over in just a second. Again, from the academic point of view, if you're interested in how gamma rays work, different elements do give off gamma rays at different frequencies. 
um, and it can tell you something about the nature of the elements that you're actually dealing with. And it follows, again, standard physical rules. So, for example, you can measure the energy of the gamma ray emissions through this very simple process and be able to actually relate it to different types of frequencies of radiation, light, etc. Okay? So, if you're interested in trying to identify what the elements are that are causing the gamma radiation, you can do it. And that's kind of cool. For example, here is uh, how this all works. There's the energy along the base, and this is showing the various emissions, or, uh, the spectro... Um, uh, uh, actually, I'm not sure what you call when it's radiation. We'll just call the different emissions at different levels, different energy levels. And you can identify the gamma rays coming off of potassium by a specific kick at 1,460 um, uh, uh, kilovolts. Uh, the thorium series can be identified at around this range, uranium, radium, etc. through here. So you can actually identify the type of radioactive decay, the type of element that is causing the decay by simply measuring the energy that's coming off of the, um, uh, off, off of the rocks. And indeed, you can do that, and it has been done to su some success for mapping out purposes. So here's um, a map from Nova Scotia, where they're mapping out the, uh, the radiation, the gamma radiation, um, tied in basically to thorium, potassium, and uranium, different color coding here, it's quite nice, and they just basically flew over the entire province, probably with a Geiger counter mounted on the base of a, an airplane or a helicopter, and measured the radiation, measured the energy of the radiation, and could map out where the various elements were. Now this is not saying that the entire region is radioactive and there's mutants living in Nova Scotia, although I have met some people from Nova Scotia that do fit the bill. What it's saying is that if you measure the radiation, you can determine where the concentrations or where the elements are. And of course this is going to be pegged in to the nature of the rocks that happen to be there. So granites are going to be enriched more in one type of element over others. Sedimentary rocks will be enriched in one type of element over others as well. Okay? So it's almost possible to use it as a mapping tool within limitations. Okay? And the limitations, of course, are how many rocks are only going to have one type of radioactive element in it and how much is it going to be there anyway to cause problems in terms of you know, kind of drift or noise. Okay, so it's cool, but it's not that relevant as far as petroleum is concerned. In petroleum, it's really, really, really rare. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen this where they actually separate out the spectra of gamma rays into different elements. It can be done. In fact, I don't know where I got this from. It's from Texas A&M. It's the ODP project, so it probably has to do more with academia than anything else. Okay? The ODP, ODP project is, uh, these are the guys that are responsible for the deep sea drilling vessels that drill holes around the world and are trying to figure out what's happening in terms of climate change, in terms of plate tectonics. All right? In this case, what they've got are some cores that go down quite deep, and this is uh, 100 500 meters, and they ran the total gamma radiation and separated it into different radioactive isotopes based upon the frequencies, which is kind of cool. But in the oil industry, to get this is rare. And as I said, I found this thing somewhere, but I've never actually seen it in any of the logs that I have actually seen. What they're concerned about is just total gamma radiation for the following reasons. All right, shales generally have the highest concentrations of potassium-40, which is a gamma ray emitter, as well as uranium and thorium, because those elements tend to get stuck to the clays. So in other words, shales tend to absorb most of the radioactive elements, regardless of what they are, where sands and limestones do not. So from their point of view, why do we care how much of the radiation is potassium? or thorium, or uranium, but all those things are going to be in the shales anyway. All right, got it? Total gamma radiation can be used as ultimately a shaley indicator. So you don't have to worry about separating things out, okay? Beware, and this is where you have to start being really clever, because as many a geologist has made a critical mistake by not recognizing that while that may be true that shales tend to concentrate the more radioactive elements, it's not always the case. Arcosic sandstones. What's an arcos? Alluvial rock with potassium, 
an immature sedimentary rock that has got a lot of feldspar in it, including the potassium feldspars. In fact, arcoses tend to be derived from granites. Why are granites pink? All right, potassium feldspar. So if you have an immature sandstone that is derived from another rock that's enriched in potassium feldspar, you see where this is going. It's going to be enriched in potassium feldspar. If that's where the radioactive stuff is, and there are some potassium feldspars that will make a Geiger counter kick over. Kind of scary, actually, when you find one of those things. Well, then, obviously, your sandstone is going to be enriched in gamma radiation, and you're not going to get deflection at all. And as I said, there have been many geologists who've seen these basically nondescript looking um, gamma ray logs and they're missing all the sandstones because they're not realizing that every once in a while you have a sandstone that's got potassium feldspar in it. Evaporites also potentially have a significant amount of potassium 40 in it. Evaporites like salt can have embedded sylvite in it as well. And if you get some very thick evaporite sequences, gamma radiation can be all over the place and be inconsistent with what you think it should actually be. There are sandstones that are cemented by clay minerals that also can give you wonky types of signals. Now these are not exactly the same as dirty sandstones. A dirty sandstone, a gray wacky, a muddy or a shaly sandstone has shale clay particles mixed in with the sand you generally tend to get a muted signal on that. It's something that you can relatively easily spot on an SP log in combination with a gamma ray log. You can tell that you're dealing with a shaley sandstone. But a sandstone that has a clay cement can give you really inconsistent signals. All right? And that's again a problem from time to time. Coal is a nightmare. Um, although coal, there's other variables that can tell you what a coal is very quickly. Uh, if you're only relying on gamma radiation, then you are not using all the techniques that are available. Uh, and apparently some dollar stones, rare ones according to my information, can absorb uranium as well. And there are also uranium enriched sandstones. Those of you that have had mineralogy have seen them. The yellowish colored sandstones, put a guide count them, they kick over like crazy. Those are not that rare. What you need in the subsurface is to have kind of a mixture of oxidizing fluids and, um, non and uh, reduced fluids, water primarily, and uranium can be transported as an oxidized fluid and if it gets to the point where it's mixing with, with conditions that are more anaerobic, it can precipitate the stuff out. If you have that in the subsurface, you can get a major kick. Now that particular stuff is so major, it's off the chart. And again, most of the time, you can identify that as being a real problem. Shales may have some radioactivity in them, but they're never as much as a, literally, a uranium enriched sandstone. Now this is more typical what you're going to get as a uh, log, and uh, here you have a gamma ray log on this side, and this one is neutron porosity, and we haven't talked about this one yet, so just please ignore this at this time, okay? Um, basically what you have here is the same type of thing as the SP log. This tends to be run in the left-hand column, a little bit thinner than the, uh, the paired log on this side. Now what you're looking at here is uh, two uh, gamma ray um, logs simultaneous. One goes from 0 to 125, then from 125 to 250. Often you'll see them actually cross over. I didn't have a chance to talk about this in class the other day when we were talking about the SP logs, but every once in a while in a column what you'll see is somebody does this and then it goes off the side and you pick it up on the other side like this. Now basically what this allows you to do is see a major deflection in terms of gamma rays or SP potential. So in other words, what you have to do is imagine this being added on to the side over here. So get used to the idea that every once in a while you're going to see these things and they, when you first look at them, they're kind of hard to identify. They're going to be a little bit more difficult on the exercises I'm giving you since they're kind of manufactured logs, but get your eye into them and you can see where these major kickbacks are on this, okay? So once again, you can identify the shales which tend to be deflected towards the right. The more deflection towards the right, the more radioactivity they have. Sandstones and limestones tend to come out here to the left meaning less radioactive except for the ringers we were talking about. All right? And again, you're going to start seeing some variability when you're dealing with very thin sand layers mixed in with shale layers. You get the idea, okay? So the amount of deflection you're getting is not necessarily telling you the amount of um, uh, gamma radiation. It may be reflective of a very thin unit. So this little kick you see here may not be a shaley sand that is this thick. It may be a sand body that is only on the order of maybe 
five centimeters thick. That is a little bit beyond the resolution of the sawn to pick it up. So what you get is a minor drop off in terms of the gamma radiation and then it recovers as you get back into the shales. So if I were interpreting this, I probably would interpret this as a thick sandstone and this as a thin little sand stringer. How thick it is is dependent upon the resolution of the, um, the device that you're actually using. Okay, so there's the shale. Deflection of the right means shale, etc. And similar to the SP logs, you can actually distinguish a shale line and a sandstone line. Now for those of you that are sitting here going like, well if it's similar to the SP log, why do we use SP logs and gamma ray logs? As it turns out, some geologists tend to favor one log over another just because they're used to it, and there is significant amounts of overlap. I tend to find that the SP logs are really good for, as from my humble opinion, for distinguishing sandstones from shales. I like them because that's what I'm used to. I also like the idea that you can actually start to pick up characterization in terms of um, depositional conditions like grain size, etc. from them. But most of the people I worked with actually preferred the gamma ray logs because, I, for, I guess it's just is because it's better at actually identifying the shale units. So the SP logs kind of pick up the sands, the gamma ray logs time to pick up the shales. And while the two of them kind of work simultaneously, you can probably get away with only using one preferentially. Although, if you got them, you might as well look at both of them, you know, I mean, to understand properties and all. So. All right, and also like um, SB logs, you can get some idea of what's happening in terms of depositional conditions. And again, diagrams like this are, are going to be put together by people who are using it for educational purposes to try and instruct people as to how you can use them for interpreting uh, components of things. Um, again, these are short course materials. For the purposes of what we're going to be doing in lab tomorrow, I'm going to try and give you some signals that might have some interpretation values. Um, if you th see something you want to discuss it and say, could this be interpreted in the following way, feel free to do that. But the logs I've produced for you are kind of, as I said, they're manufactured to allow you to come up with some sort of decent conclusions. So some of them may actually not be drawn in the way that you might interpret them to be. So if I look at this and say maybe but maybe not, it probably means it's because you caught something that I actually had not intended. All right, so that's one of the perils of, of having manufactured um, lab exercises, etc. Um, okay, and again, uh, I'm trying to get an idea of, of just using these things as one log to come up with all the interpretation you're going to need in the, uh, uh, for interpreting what the rocks are like is unwise. Uh, so here what you see is, in this case, alternation between shale and dolomite, shale and limestone and sandstones. And you're going to notice that in terms of the gamma ray indications, all the signals are consistent. Yeah, the shales are easy to spot, but there's dolomite with 10% porosity. There's limestone with 10% porosity. There's sandstone with 20% porosity. And you can't tell what those rocks are based solely on the gamma ray logs. Nor could you do it solely on the SP logs. If you don't have cores, you have to come up with other types of, um, of devices that are going to give you an idea of what the actual uh, properties are. So on this side here, you're going to see two additional components. One is the neutron, the neutron activation log, which we'll talk about the next time we meet. And then we have the density logs, which are kind of shown here in green. Sometimes they overlap. Now, the pairing of these two components with gamma ray and or SP gives you a lot more flexibility in terms of interpretation. For example, notice for the dolomite with 10%, the neutron log kind of kicks in this direction, density comes out here like this. The limestones, the two of them overlap, and you actually get a crossover effect in terms of some of the sandstones. Now this is not always consistent. There are going to be variables. For example, if you have a sandstone with 1% porosity, you're not going to see this. If the sandstone is actually filled up with water rather than oil or natural gas, it might be a slightly different type of, of, of inflection. The point is that if you start taking this type of response, combining it with other types of responses that the sond is going to be able to produce for you, you have a lot more power of resolving what the nature of the rocks are going to be like. But ultimately, 
you're still going to have to rely most upon getting physical samples because like everything you still have to be able to ground truth your data and the physical samples that are available to you may not always be cores they may just be the cuttings right? and sometimes literally if you're in your office you're trying to figure out something you may have to go down to wherever the facility is where you store this stuff go down with your hand lens look at the core or look at the hole that they were drilling get the box of all the cuttings pull out the one at the level you think it is pull it in your hand get your hand lens out try to figure out if it's a dollar stone or a limestone or a sandstone or something else all right so never forget your roots always be able to recognize rocks and understand how they work because there are going to be times where the data is not doing exactly what you would like it to do it's just the way it is all right now with that Yay! We're getting better. Um, we're going to call it quits at this point, and um, I just want to again remind you: tomorrow is your first major lab. Now get here on time. We will be in here. I'll get as many pairs of scissors and tape dispensers as possible. You guys got some cutting to do. While you're at it, now is the time to start assembling your oil mapping kits. Everybody needs to get themselves a good set of colored pencils. All right, at least 12 different colors and you will be using them. If you have a little portable pencil sharpener, I would recommend you get that as well. Okay? We're going to be needing to lay things out into a large format. We still have our roll of paper at the back. Get used to using that. Make it look neat. Make it look tidy. I'll go over how to do this in lab tomorrow. But ultimately, you've got to be able to put these sections together, these, um, uh, these logs together, do some correlations, and ultimately come up with some sort of a subsurface map that will allow you to determine where likely places are for looking for oil and natural gas. This is going to be a three-step process. Tomorrow's lab, we're looking at five logs that come from five holes from a fictitious uh, uh, well field um, based on SP and resistivity correlations. The following week will be another five wells using gamma ray and I believe neutron activation for it. Those will give you a cross section arrangement. One line going like this, one line going more or less like this. On the basis of those correlations and how you correlate the different rock units, you will be able to more or less establish a map and that, that, will be correspond, that will be what we do in the third week of our lab exercises, okay? Now next Monday, uh, it's going to be another online lecture. I'm trying to figure out if I want to do another online lecture or whether I want to just basically change things around. I think I have one free lecture coming up in the next couple of weeks. I might give you a holiday on Monday. I'll let you know in lab tomorrow as to what we do on that, okay? Um, that's all right? Well, I'm not officially allowed to give you holidays. The dean doesn't like that now, so we may have to kind of do it in kind of a subtle way and all. I'm sorry, what? Oh, you guys are going this weekend, right? Okay. How, who's going to, to GSA? You and who else? All right, two of you. Well, we'll work on that anyway. Either way, it'll be online lecture, which you can access it later on, or else it'll be something you're not going to miss anyway. When do you come back? On Tuesday night? Oh, so you'll be back on Wednesday then? Okay. All right. Well, that's a possibility then. We'll think about it, okay? All right, folks. We'll see you in lab tomorrow. As I said, be here at 2 o'clock. That's when things are going to get exciting. At least from my point of view, I don't know about you. And when you start bitching and complaining about how you have to color all this stuff, that's when I'm going to start sending you the messages from our students who are now in graduate work and school doing that very thing.